Welcome back to the Diet Doctor Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Brett Schur. Today, we're joined by Dr. Sachin Panda, and this is a real treat because Dr. Panda is really on the forefront and one of the leaders in the world on circadian rhythm research and time-restricted eating research. And one of my benefits being here in San Diego, Dr. Panda's local. He's here at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies in La Jolla, where he is a professor of regulator- in the regulatory biology department. And like I mentioned, he is an expert on circadian rhythms, and he has a very prolific lab where they have done a number of experiments in mice and in humans. And that's what I find so interesting that we're going to talk a little bit about how he has the experience in both mice and humans and why he got into human research, which is a really interesting story that I hope you'll enjoy. But in this discussion, we talk all about time-restricted eating, where it came from, where it started, what was the initial uh, thought or hypothesis that sort of birthed it, and how it's transitioned over time, what Dr. Panda thinks is sort of the sweet spot for time-restricted eating, and why he thinks it works for health, um, and what it can do to improve people's health, where you know, where people are going to get the most benefits and why it's so easy to do for so many people. And then of course, what's the future and where's it going? We get into all these discussions. Um, and Dr. Panda really knows this literature and the science better than anybody. And I'm very glad he took the time, uh, to sit with us and and talk with me today. If you want to find more, um, from Dr. Panda, you can find him on Twitter at Sachin Panda. Um, you can also find him at mycircadianclock.org, which is a great site um, that he and the folks at Salk Institute run where you can sort of take pictures of your food and log when you eat to give you an idea of when you're eating, not so much of what you're eating, but when you're eating. And then you can also find them, of course, at the Salk Institute website as well. So thank you for joining us, and I hope you enjoy uh, this episode with Dr. Sachin Panda. And just a quick quick word before we start, though, this is going to be part of a two-part series on intermittent fasting and time-restricted eating. So, so check in for our next, next episode for even more information, more on the clinical side of time-restricted eating and intermittent fasting. Well, Dr. Sachin Panda, thank you so much for joining me today on the Diet Doctor podcast. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Well, you certainly deserve a lot of credit, if not almost all the credit, for kind of rekindling or restarting this whole concept of fasting as a health intervention because you've you've pioneered the science that really I think started this new clinical wave. Now I don't know, you may disagree with that because I know you're not always uh, comfortable with all the praise, but in my mind you deserve it. But I want to go back to the beginning and ask you from the beginning, why did you even think this would work? What in your brain said, you know what, I should study time-restricted eating because I think it's going to provide health benefits. How did it all start? Yeah, so I work on uh a very foundational science called circadian rhythm. And when we think of circadian rhythm, the first thing that comes to your mind is our brain needs to sleep every night. And during sleep, the brain resets, repairs itself and rejuvenates so that we are a new person every single day. And if you think about that cycle, then it becomes very clear that our brain is most functional. We can do complex math. We can do debate and argument and all that stuff during daytime. In the middle of the night, if you wake me up, my brain cannot do many of the stuff at the same efficiency. But over the last 25 years, one big discovery in the field of circadian rhythm is just like our brain has a clock, Almost every organ in our body has a clock. So that means every organ, just like the brain, also needs a good downtime to repair, reset, and rejuvenate. So that means uh, we as humans, we are programmed to eat uh, only during the wakeful hours for several, for a few hours. And then our body, our stomach, our gut, our heart, lungs, all these organs, they need that downtime to repair, recover, and rejuvenate from the stress of digesting and um, and assimilating the nutrient that we eat. So based on that idea, we did a very simple experiment. We asked, um, by keeping the same number of calories, if we eat at this different time, then what happens? So since my lab works on basic science and laboratory. So we took some lab mice 
and we divided them into two different groups. And they were same identical. They had the same identical genes. They were from the same family, same parents, same room, same gut microbiome. They ate the same number of calories. They ate the same quality of food. The only difference was one group was allowed to eat whenever they wanted. And then the other group, the second group, was allowed to eat the same number of calories within a restricted time. So that is every night for eight to 10 hours. Mice are nocturnal, so that's why we asked them to eat during nighttime. And what was surprising was after 18 weeks in the first experiment, we found that the mice that ate any time, they became obese, diabetic, they had liver disease, they have heart disease, all kinds of diseases, chronic diseases that we often hear about. But the mice that ate in a time-restricted fashion, but the same number of calories from the same food were completely protected. And this was mind blowing to us because in the entire history of nutrition science, we knew that the quality and quantity of nutrition matter. But here, we did not change quality. We did not change quantity. The only thing that we changed was give the mice enough time for their organs to repair, reset, and rejuvenate. And by doing that, they were completely protected from disease. And that led to this idea of what we call it time-restricted eating or time-restricted feeding because we're actually, in all these laboratory experiments, we do not change their calorie content. And so they're typically not going through quote-unquote fasting, which usually denotes that you reduce some calorie, at least on some days. So that's how we stumbled on this idea. Yeah, and I think that's so interesting that it started with this concept of all the cells in your body having a circadian rhythm, which you're right, is not something that people sort of naturally think about. We think just sort of like the brain and the sleep-wake cycle. But it's interesting that you said they can recover from the stress of digestion and the stress of nutrient assimilation, because that's another concept that we don't think about that actually is a stress or a strain on our bodies. And is there is there some evidence to support that like, you know, either stress hormones or uh, inflammatory markers or something increases during um, eating and digestion that made that led you to think that that was a, a stress on the body? Well, if you just imagine, you take a plate of whatever you are eating and you leave it outside, it's not going to digest by itself within four to five hours. And you got to put a pour a lot of acids and then different chemicals and then break it down. It will get uh, kind of it will break down and then your stomach has to absorb. So it's very similar process that happens in our stomach or our, or our gut lining. Our stomach actually produces a huge amount of acid, digestive juice that breaks mm -hmm. down all this stuff. And it's almost like uh, cooking. If, you, if you're cooking anything in your cooking pan, then after you finish cooking, you have to clean that pan. So uh, literally the gut lining nearly seven to 10% of our gut lining cells actually get damaged or destroyed during this digestion and nutri nutrition assimilation process. And that lining itself, to begin there, that lining itself has to be repaired every night. The second is, you know, we eat a lot of stuff that our body actually does not need. For example, our body actually does not need vanilla flavor or any flavoring agent that you use many spices, uh, many food coloring agents, there are a lot of stuff, even in natural product, even in green vegetables and, uh, and tomato and everything. So those are unnecessary products and some of them do damage our cells, uh, damage the inside of the cells. And so that's the second thing. Third thing is when we break down all this nutrient, then we also produce a little bit of toxin. And when you're eating, we also eat some bacteria and fungi, and then some of them are good, some of them are bad. So every day there is some stress of digesting and assimilating nutrient. And our body, really what people say, you have to detoxify. <laughs> and it's not toxin that we intentionally eat, that is part of our food. And that needs to be, so that's why our organs have to repair, reset and rejuvenate every single day. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a fascinating study. And like you said, you were sort of blown away by the results and very impressed by the results. But 
then, you know, as a clinician, as people, we say, okay, but that's in mice. So what does it mean for humans? Is it going to mean the same thing for humans? So then you and others then have sort of transitioned to doing studies in humans as well. Tell us about one of your first human studies that made you think, aha, this is going to be exactly the same in humans as it is in mice. Well, the first thing is since our concept was based on this 24 hours circadian rhythm, uh, that's conserved between human, mouse, fruit fly, and even pond scum. <laughs> so every organism on our planet has this 24 hours rhythm. So that means whatever we discover in one system has been easily translated to another system. So we're very confident that this might work out in humans. But the question was, do humans eat like our laboratory mice when they were eating in the middle of their sleep cycle or they were eating randomly late into their active phase. And uh, this was, again, something that we were forced into because of our critiques. Uh, there was a lot of criticism from clinicians and nutritionists who just foo-fooed our work saying, hey, humans don't eat like mice. We don't yeah. wake up in the middle of the night and we eat. Most humans eat three square meals within 12 hours interval. So your work has no human significance. And, you know, they had a point because we never went and tested when humans eat. And when we went back to the literature, we also found that unfortunately, or fortunately you can say, because it left an opening for us, nutrition science never ever, and I can emphasize this word, never ever longitudinally looked at when people eat over several days, because we know that we eat differently between weekday, weekend, and uh, what we eat, when we eat, all that stuff changes. The gold standard of nutrition research is asking people, what did you eat in the last 24 hours? It doesn't take never into ask account. when, yeah. And it doesn't take into account how much variation is there from day to day, how many times mm -hmm. they're eating in the middle of the night. So then it forced us to start a very simple app that is now My Circadian Clock. That's the name of the app. And we built this app in the lab and we asked, invited 150 people from San Diego area who were not doing any shift work. And we also knew that uh, students can have very bad lifestyles. So we said, you cannot be a student. Okay. And you cannot be a shift worker. You have to be a nine to five office worker, average human being. And then we asked them, you do very simple thing. You just open the app, take a picture of what you eat, and then press save. We didn't ask them to say, what is the portion size, what they eat, and all that stuff. Just three click. And they had to do it for three weeks because we wanted to know when how they eat during weekday weekend. To our surprise, what we found is nearly 50% of adults ate for roughly 15 hours or longer. So that means if they had their first cup of coffee with cream at 6 a.m., the last glass of beer or wine or uh, milk was happening after 9 p.m. And they were doing it at least two to three nights in a week. Um, because we know that just like when you fly from East Coast to West Coast, your brain circadian rhythm gets messed up and you have jet lag. Similarly, even for one or two nights, if we eat late into the night, that messes up our circadian rhythm. Hmm. So that was an aha moment. Like, yes, half of the humans actually eat like mice and they eat really over a long period of time. And only 10% of people actually eat for less than 12 hours. And wow. that was an eye-opening um, moment. So that means let's simplify our findings. Suppose say somebody is eating for 15 hours, or even if you are eating for 12 hours, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So that means after the last bite at 6 p.m., a stomach is still working on digesting that food because digestion doesn't work like a magic, like in two minutes, it's all digested. It takes at least five hours. Your stomach is still working. So your 6 p.m. dinner is being digested until at least 11 p.m. or midnight. And that's when your stomach is getting rest. You go back to repair and reset mode. And then if you're starting again, 
at 6 a.m. in the morning, then your stomach is getting only six to seven hours of quote unquote sleep because that's when it's actually having rest time. Okay. So that means we thought if people can eat for 10 hours, then their stomach will get the same seven to eight hours of rest time because you subtract now five to six hours for digestion. Mm -hmm. So then we asked, well, people who are eating for 14 hours or longer, we asked them, hey, can you do a simple thing? You don't have to pay attention to what or how much you are eating. You just have to pay attention to when you are eating and then try to eat within 10 hours. Because we thought 10 hours is a okay number because a lot of people can adopt to 10 hours over several days. And in our mouse study, what we had found was even if mice were fed for nine to 10 hours for five days, and then they kind of cheated for two, two days in the weekend, they were still healthy enough. So we thought if humans do the same thing, we didn't tell them that they can cheat, but we hope we expected that once or twice they will cheat. And what we found was they could actually uh, stick to this 10 hours regimen. And this was, again, another eye-opening because, you know, I can come up with a new regimen saying that, you know, if you do 10,000 steps every day, then you will reverse your diabetes. But then how many of us can actually do 10,000 steps for even five days? It's very hard. So one key important piece is whatever we find, can people practice it? So they yeah. practice. And we found that they lost modest amount of weight, three to four percent, but these are not obese people. They were just a little bit overweight. And after 18 weeks, uh, we let them go. And then after a year, when we contacted them, we were surprised that they were still sticking to the 10 hours window. Uh, we didn't have to, they didn't have to, but they just loved it. And we asked why. And they said they were sleeping much better. They were feeling more energetic in the morning. And many of them, who had stomach issue, digestion issue, those are gone and the joints were uh, less uh, painful. So this was interesting because when you do mouse study, you cannot ask a mouse, how are you sleeping? Right. Do you feel more energy in the morning? You can ask them, <laughs> but you won't get the answer. <laughs> so that was really fascinating that, um, you know, when you ask people to fast or when you ask people to restrict that calorie, count calorie. It's a very stressful experience. Not eating for a day is a very stressful experience. And don't, people don't enjoy that. They don't do it every day. But eating within 10 hours, we realized that people actually enjoyed it. So that's why they yeah. stopped to it. So that was how all of this started. And th so that's why sometimes, you know, people may criticize your work, but that's a good impetus for some to go back and test themselves. And unless, if, we, <laughs> if we had a smooth selling and no one had questioned our work, I would have never gone to do human research. So I would like to thank all of my critics of my early mouse work. <laughs> That's a fa fascinating point right there, that if you hadn't gotten that criticism, you wouldn't have done the human research. I think that's fantastic. And I'm so glad you did because you proved the feasibility, just how easy it is for people to do, that it's not that hard of an ask and that it's effective even at that short window. You know, some people are talking about one meal a day, alternate day fasting, five day fast, but this is about as easy as it gets and it's effective. But now here's the next question. Why is it effective? Because if you're not restricting calories, you're not restricting what you eat, you're only putting it within a time frame, and you're talking about the mechanism being gut healing and gut restoring how does that help lose weight and improve type 2 diabetes and lower blood pressure and improve metabolic health? Or is it sort of the downstream effects that people are sleeping better, feeling better, taking better care of themselves, and that's why it happens? Or is it the lower insulin levels that people are talking about? So what are your thoughts about the mechanism for why it has beneficial effects? I think this is a, this is a billion or trillion dollar question mm -hmm. because, you know, for example, calorie restriction increases lifespan. It was known almost close to 100 years ago. The discovery was made, and we are still trying to figure out why. We know that exercise is the best medicine because exercise improves mood, does so many different things, and we're still trying to figure out. Similarly, what I think is we are just beginning to understand how this time restricted eating improves health. But we have the luxury of knowing what else improves health. 
So for example, we know, um, say, metformin, for example, which mimics fasting, acts on a kinase called AMP kinase, that's a fasting-induced kinase. And that, when it is triggered, then it triggers one thing that is burning fat. It triggers fat oxidation and a lot of different things. So that way we are fortunate enough that we, we are kind of leveraging the wisdom of the field, the discoveries from many different people, many different scientists and leaders. And what we are finding are many fold. One is when people do animals mostly because we do animals research, so then we can go and take out the tissues and look at the molecules. What we find is um, when animals do this time-restricted eating, then their um, pancreas gets enough rest to prime the cells to produce just enough insulin uh, when the mice start eating. So the pancreas does not produce excessive insulin um, during fasting time. So that's so the fasting insulin level actually drops in mice that do time-restricted eating. We don't know why, but we know at least the insulin levels go down. Right. Mm -hmm. And second thing is in liver, our liver produces some glucose when we fast. It's known because the liver has to produce some glucose that will fuel our brain because our brain is dependent on glucose. But in type 2 diabetes, in many disease, liver disease, this mechanism that should be on only when the liver is when we are fasting stays on throughout 24 hours, as if the circadian rhythm in glucose production is non-functional. So that contributes to increased glucose because the liver is producing glucose, we are eating, all the glucose is flooding our blood. And when mice do this time-restricted eating, this process called gluconeogenesis, making new glucose, that shuts down during the eating period. So for half of the day, the liver is not producing excess glucose. And that might partly explain why the glucose levels remain normal. The third thing is when I say this gluconeogenesis, that glucose is made by breaking down protein in the muscle. And if for half of the day, the liver is not making that new glucose from breakdown muscle protein, then the muscle must be getting healthier. And that's exactly what we find. At least in half of our mouse experiments we have seen, the muscle mass increases under time restricting. And it's not only just dysfunctional muscle mass that is increasing, these are functional muscle mass because these mice can stay on a treadmill for a very long time. They can exercise, they have much better motor coordination. So in that way, now we are talking about at least the gut, uh, the liver, pancreas, and muscle. And the same thing we find in um, fat tissues, during the fasting time, there is enough drive or enough deficit of energy that the fat tissue now begin to break down the fat that's needed when we fast. And that fatty acid also comes to the liver, broken down again to ketone bodies or ketogenesis happens, and that fuels um, the body. And all of these are interlinked because for this process, for the, for the fat breakdown to happen, uh, one thing that happens in the liver is uh, excess cholesterol gets broken down. And that's because the circadian clock in the liver becomes more strong. And there is one of the clock component, clock protein, that is actually responsible for turning on this mechanism to break down cholesterol to bile acids. So we break down cholesterol and our bile acids level go up which is pretty good for us. And some of that bile acids go to the fat cells and uh, they tell the fat cells that it's time to break down your fat so that the liver needs some fat for making ketones. So, so now you can see that it's not one thing that happens during time restricting, at least five or six different things that we know for now. And that list is continuing to grow because we know that there are some benefits to the heart. We know there are some benefits to the kidney, and we haven't even touched that. But at least in another model in fruit flies, we see the heart actually continues to function much better. Hmm. The heart beats much better. The flies actually remain more active. They can fly into their late <laughs> age. 
And uh, if we think about it, since the number one cause for death or disability throughout the world is heart disease, and if time restricting can improve heart function, that means hopefully this will also help people who have heart disease. Oh, well, that, that's fascinating. I mean, as you said, there's not just one mechanism, there are multiple mechanisms. And again, something that's so easy to do that can have so many beneficial downstream effects is pretty impressive. But I wanna to touch on one that you mentioned, specifically muscle. And actually, as timing has it, as the day we're doing this interview, you just had a publication come out yesterday in Cell Reports, um, another mouse study showing the improvement in fatty liver and glucose in muscle mass and endurance in the mice, which I find so interesting because one of the criticisms against fasting or even time-restricted eating is the potential for loss of muscle mass. So there's the balance of protein not coming in, nutrients not coming in, but then the body increases growth hormone, um, and some, which presumably could help maintain that muscle mass. So I'm curious what you think of that balance. You've seen it in mice. Do you think it'll play out in humans? Do you think there is this potential for increase or preservation of muscle mass rather than a loss of muscle mass, mass with time-restricted eating in humans? Well, the thing is most people in um, most humans who do time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting, sometimes they uh, push it to too much, too extreme and they may be reducing their caloric intake or they may be reducing their protein intake. And one thing I must emphasize again and again is in all our mouse studies, we make sure that the mice eat the same number of calories from the same food as the ad libitum or any time eating mice. So we are not reducing calories. We are not reducing any protein component or anything. And this is a huge difference between human studies and mouse because many um, people inadvertently reduce their food intake. Um, but there are other studies, for example, there are studies, well-controlled studies done on um, resistance-trained athletes who did time restricted eating, the muscle mass remained constant, they uh, slightly reduced their fat mass. And that's a very good example because these people are very mindful, resistance training, athletes, they're very mindful of their food. Um, they have tried their best to reduce their fat mass and build up their muscle mass. And when they did this time restricting, they didn't change too much of their nutrition quality, um, but still it helped them to reduce their uh, fat mass and preserve muscle mass. So that's why we have to keep that in mind that when people do intermittent fasting or time restricting, uh, they may reduce calories. So that's why we don't use the word fasting anywhere in our study because fasting has a negative connotation for a lot of people. Many people think fasting is a painful experience that can reduce nutrition intake and can deteriorate uh, health by reducing muscle and other stuff. So we don't use the word uh, to emphasize that you should not uh, drastically reduce your food intake. Yeah, I think that's a great point to differentiate the mouse and human studies and what the what the potential differences are there and the importance that if you are following time-restricted eating to make sure you're still getting adequate protein and to make sure you're still doing some physical activity to maintain your, yeah. your muscle structure. So that's a very good point there. Um, now, another question that's on a lot of people's minds though, when it comes to time-restricted eating is sort of like, where's the sweet spot or where's the minimal effective dose, right? Because if you know, if, yeah. if fasting for 10 hours is going to give you the same benefit of fasting for 14 hours, no one's going to fast for 14 hours. Everybody's going to go for the minimal effective dose. So I know it's hard to translate from mouse studies to human studies and that we don't have robust human studies comparing, you know, very slim differences in time frames. but you know the literature better than anybody. In your mind, where do you think that sweet spot is where most people are going to get um, the most benefit from their time-restricted eating? Well, this is a interesting point because it all depends on what's their health goal and where they are currently. Um, so that's why we um, created this app, My Circadian Clock. People can self-monitor themselves for a couple of weeks uh, by not changing their eating habit. Just see when you eat and how much you eat. And then after two weeks, if you see that you are eating window, daily eating window, it actually calculates over two weeks. So it sees when is the earliest you ate, when is the latest you ate. And if that is, say, 16 hours, then 
even if you reduce that window by four hours and come to 12 hours, that's a very good starting point. Um, so it all depends on that delta. Where are you right now? And if you are above, say, 14 hours, then try to bring it down to 12 hours. Try for a couple of weeks. And then you see, can you bring it down to 10 hours? And um, even if you can bring it down to 10 hours for five days, um, that's pretty good. Because once you can bring it down to 10 hours for five days, then your body actually trains itself. You don't have to tell your body. In the weekend, you'll notice that if you eat outside this 10-hour window late into the night, then next day your body will revolt. You'll have food hangover as if your stomach forgot to digest your food is punishing you. <laughs> then you'll come back to that 10 hours window. Yeah. So that's, um, a good, so that's a good start because if you think about it, you know, if we start, say, around eating our, breaking our fast, uh, nine or 10 o'clock in the morning, then your last meal should be five or six in the evening. And then uh, that's doable for most people because you can still have one meal with your loved one. Uh, if you bring it down to eight hours or six hours, then it can put some stress on social connection and other stuff. And so the bottom line is anyone from five-year-old to 100-year-old can practice 12 hours of time-restricted eating. It's almost like brushing your teeth once a day. And, yeah. but that doesn't mean that by brushing your teeth once a day, you will never go to dentist. You will still go to dentist. <laughs> but if you, if you can brush your teeth twice a day and floss your teeth, so that's like eight hours time-restricted eating, then maybe going to dentist will re reduce. And then if you can do a 10 hours time-restricted eating for at least five to six days, then that's pretty good enough because though in those 10 hours, what we're finding is many people who have high blood pressure, they reduce their blood pressure as if they're taking a blood pressure medication. It, the benefit is similar to taking a blood pressure medication. And then those who have mild hyperglycemia like pre-diabetes or early stage type 2 diabetes, if they do 10 hours time eating, then they see much better glucose control. It's almost like taking a low dose metformin. And then those who have um, high LDL cholesterol, if they do eight to 10 hours, it takes a little bit longer time, maybe three to four months, then they can see improvement in reducing their LDL cholesterol. So these are based on clinical studies and all these clinical studies that we did with Dr. Pam Tov of UCSD using this My Circadian Clock app. What we're finding is when people do 10 hours, um, particularly, people who have pre-existing condition, because they are the ones who are going to see the best health benefit. Uh, they can sustain this 10 hours time restricting for up to a year. At least two thirds of our participants can sustain it for one year without much handholding after three months. So we think that's a good sweet spot. And once you practice it, the benefit is Suppose say you do it for three months and then you fall off the wagon. So then that doesn't mean that you cannot go back because you can always go back. And you know that this is one item in your health menu that you can always practice. Okay. So that was very important. So the bottom line is anyone from five to 100 years old can do 12 hours and begin from there. And then at least for five days, try to eat for 10 hours. And if you really want to improve the outcome, then eight hours is a good number. But those who have diabetes, then you should be under medical supervision. Or those who experience hypoglycemia for any other reason, then you should be under supervision. Yeah, great point. Anybody who's taking medications, and especially if you're blood sugar medications, you need to work with your physician because you are going to get some big swings in there. Yeah. So I'm glad you brought up the part about though having a meal with your loved ones, with your family, because that, you know, we have to be honest, we don't eat food in a vacuum. It's frequently a social thing, especially for people with families. Breakfast mm -hmm. is usually rush, rush, rush as you're getting the kids out the door or something. And then lunch is kind of on your own. And then dinner in our culture is the big sit down meal where everybody gets together as a family. Obviously it's not like that for everybody, but for most people. But is that the way we should be eating? What about not just how long the window is, but where is the window? Do you, have you 
have you seen evidence either in mouse and in humans that that matters if you move the window sooner, maybe against what our current culture is and your biggest meals around three or four as opposed to six or seven, does that have an impact as well as the, the duration of the window? Well, there is not much research in early versus late. Uh, even if there is research, those are not powered enough to make really meaningful conclusion. Um, but what is very clear is uh, if we put all these together, because we also know that sleep is important, we also know that if you eat too close to your bedtime, that will disturb your sleep. You cannot sleep well. And then the next day morning, since you're cranky and your brain cannot function well, you're more likely to eat junk food and other stuff will happen. Um, then another aspect of our circadian rhythm research is how light is important for our brain health during the daytime. But light is actually a bad thing to have <laughs> late into the night because we know that we cannot sleep in a lighted room. So now if we put all of this together, then what emerges will help everybody to figure out their sweet spot. So one bottom line is um, you should sleep, you should be in bed for at least eight hours because being in bed for eight hours will help you to find at least seven to seven and a half hours of sleep, which is good for brain health, metabolic health, long-term health. And also people who sleep for seven hours they're more likely to live longer. That's also done on millions of people in many different continents over the last 20 years. So let's keep eight hours in bed consistently. Then after we wake up, um, that's the time when our hormones change. Our night hormones are slowly going down. For example, melatonin is slowly going down and our day hormones, stress hormones are coming back up. And that's the bad time to eat because your organs are trying to adjust to a different hormonal condition. So that's why try to avoid food for at least one or better even two hours after waking up. So if you're waking up at 6 a.m., then it's better not to eat anything before 8 a.m. Um, and then after your first bite of calories of coffee with cream or sugar, then count that 10 hours. And that will be 6 p.m. And um, of course, you can delay that. I mean, so you can 10, 10 and a half or 11 is okay. But then your last meal should be at least two hours before you go to bed because these first two hours after meal, your body is trying to digest a lot of food. So there is a lot of blood rushing towards the core or your digestive organs and your core body temperature is high and it's not a good condition for you to go to a deep sleep when that happens. So try to avoid food for two, at least two hours before going to bed. And also dim down your light so that your natural melatonin hormone goes up. So that's also another time when the hormones are changing their shift work. <laughs> the night <laughs> right, hormones right. are turning on, the day hormones are coming going down and it's not a good idea to eat. It's very simple. So now, Let's start with this. Um, try to be in bed for eight hours. And after waking up, wait for at least one or two hours before your first meal. And then count 10 hours. That's when all your meals should be. And then make sure that your last meal happens two to three hours before going to bed. And no bright light and no food for two to three hours before going to bed. And if you want to boost it up, then during daytime, Go outside and walk for at least 30 minutes because you'll get both exercise and bright daylight that improves your mood. Very good. And it might be a little off topic, but you're, since you are the circadian rhythm expert, do you turn your lights down at night? Do you wear blue blocking glasses? Like what's your routine to prepare you for bed and prepare your circadian rhythm to be on point for bed? So that's actually not off topic. That's exactly what I discovered 20 years ago. And this was considered one of the top 10 breakthroughs of the year by Science Magazine. We discovered the blue light receptor in our retina that senses blue light and resets our circadian clock. And then the same blue light receptor also connects to part of the brain that makes us more alert and reduces depression. So that means in practice, we should have daylight, which is the richest source of blue light during the daytime to uplift our mood and reduce depression. That's the best anti-depression. It's plentiful and free. You just have to step outside for 30 minutes. And then at nighttime, 
we have to reduce blue light. So the reason why all your rectangular pieces of glowing objects, your TV screen, your laptop, your cell phone, all of them have this night shift feature is based on that discovery that we made. And if you reduce blue light, crank up your orange light for working, then that also helps you. And yeah, so in um, the bottom line is you should not have any bright blue LED in your bedroom or in your kitchen or your living room. That's what we do. We have only the um, old style, very dim light in all of these places where I am in the evening. I don't actually uh, wear the blue blocking glasses, but maybe I'm still producing enough melatonin that I don't need that, but maybe when I get older and my body cannot produce enough or maybe I'm more sensitive to light, then I will do that. Well, it's interesting that there could be an age component in there. I hadn't really heard that, but that, that could make sense. Yeah, no, because one thing is, um, you know, uh, as we is, one big thing that happens is our melatonin level drops precipitously. So a 60-year-old uh, makes 10% or less of melatonin than a six-year-old um, and that's a that's something that we don't discuss, um, but it's a fact. Right, that makes sense. Well, I, I do want to be respectful of your time, but I have two final questions for you here. One is this concept of if a little bit of time restricted eating or a little bit of fasting is good, then more has to be better. What do you? How do you answer that? You know, running for five miles is good. Why don't you run for fifty miles then? Right, because it's hard to do. I don't want to know people don't want to do that. It's going to hurt. Yeah, so that's why there is a there is a there is a sweet spot. You don't want to you want to give your body rest, but you should not deprive your body. And when you go for a longer time, then you overstress your body and your organs. And um, when you do it repeatedly, four or five times in a month or so, then that can be stressful. Whereas some stress, like for example, some people do five days of water fasting or low calorie diet for four or five days. Um, that's okay. So, you know, this is a emerging science. Nutrition science is a, always interesting because one thing is we can do many of these experiments in mice and understand the physiology. Um, we can put a lot of sensors. We can do all kinds of modern molecular biology stuff, but it's really hard to do all that stuff in human. Mm -hmm. uh, so until we understand what translates to human, we should not overdo it based on some somebody who personally felt better and then says, okay, I felt better, so I should, everybody should do it. Right. I stick to the science. We have to, we have to stick to the science and we have to see who can do it, who will likely to get an adverse effect from it. And once we understand that, then we can identify people who can benefit and also identify people who may suffer from it. Well, that could be the perfect segue to my final question, which is where is the future of fasting research and time-restricted eating research headed from a not just the research, but a clinical standpoint and a technology standpoint. What do you see as the as the bright future of where it's headed? I think there are a lot of things. What we see in in circadian rhythm research or time restricting research, it's almost um, what we now understand is we have been living on this planet with our circadian rhythm for the last two hundred thousand years, but only in the last ten years we woke up to its importance. Um, that means almost all of us are living few years in our life with disrupted circadian rhythm. So this is very similar to the moment in 1970s when we, the lead and asbestos moment, <laughs> for example, when we understood that lead and asbestos in buildings are really bad. Yeah. And it, it is taking us almost 50 years to remove lead and asbestos and rebuild our buildings. So similarly, Smoking is bad. That was discovered in 60s and 70s. And we are still trying to figure out how to make a smoke-free environment. So similarly, in circadian rhythm research, the time-restricted eating, although the concept is very interesting, has huge public health benefit, we also have to understand. Uh, and we see that this is a multi-solving solution. There are very few things that we do every day that solves many things. 
and this is one of them. It helps you to prevent disease and those who have the disease, it helps them to cure themselves faster. And then the third thing is it can be combined with certain drugs to accelerate cure. And then fourth is rehab. People who have gone through a serious health issue can time restricted eating with optimal nutrition bring them back to the peak performance. Because at the end of the day, every human being, irrespective of age, gender, ethnicity, or nationality, has a universal human aspiration and human right. And that is to live our peak physical, intellectual, and emotional performance for our entire life. And in that context, can we figure out time restricting, maybe for 12 hours for kids, maybe for 10 hours for young adults, maybe for eight hours for people who are going through therapy, and with what combination it can help people at every stage, in every ethnicity, at every health condition. So that's the bigger goal for the future. That's a very ambitious goal, and I love to hear that. And uh, I think the future is very bright, and I look forward to seeing more from you and your lab and all your colleagues as they contribute to that goal. So thank you so much for your work, and thank you for taking the time to spend with us today on the Diet Doctor podcast. Thank you, and have a perfect circadian day. Well, that was a great episode. I really enjoyed speaking with Dr. Panda, and you can see how he knows the science so well. And as I mentioned, this is part one of a two-part series of time-restricted eating and intermittent fasting. So join us next time for the second part, where we're going to get into more of the clinical aspects and the clinical um, tips for success with time-restricted eating and intermittent fasting. And also, one last thing, I want to mention our Diet Doctor Pro membership, DD Pro, which is designed for clinicians. So if you are a clinician listening, whether you're a doctor, a nurse practitioner, a dietitian, a health coach, a personal trainer, anybody in the health field, we want to connect with you with our DD Pro membership so we can help you succeed with your clients and help your clients succeed. We want to provide the information, the um the programs, the content, uh, the meal planning, the, the uh, shopping lists, and help you achieve greater success. So if you're interested, please check out Diet Doctor Pro at our Diet Doctor website, or you can always reach out to me and send me an email, brett at dietdoctor.com. Thanks a lot for joining us, and we'll see you next time on the Diet Doctor Podcast.